Good morning, or perhaps afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from. I'm delighted to see such a wonderful turnout today for our conversation. The topic of the day, as you all know, vaccinating America quickly, safely, and equitably. My name is Sema Sagayer, and I'm co-founder and CEO of Sergo Ventures. We are a nonprofit um, focused on solving health and social problems with precision. I'm so, so honored today to have an incredible group of experts that will join me and talk about the huge challenge that we have before us, not just as a nation, but as a global community. I'm going to introduce each of these experts in just a minute. But first I wanna tell you why I believe the COVID vaccination campaign is the challenge of our time. I don't think we, any of us remember ever before a time in history when we had to vaccinate not only so many people, but so many people in such a short amount of time and with new vaccine technologies. Unlike normal vaccination campaigns, with COVID, we need to move quickly than ever before. Every passing minute means more deaths, more strain on our healthcare system, and as you all know, delays in opening our economies fully. And also, we must take an equitable approach. It's been increasing, incredibly unfortunate, um, for example, that COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on communities of color, among other communities. But before I introduce our speakers, let's recap the numbers of where we are with this vaccination campaign. So let's look globally first. In around the world, about 132 million people, that's 1.7% of the world's population, a very, very small number, have received their first shot of COVID-19 vaccine. And an, another 46 million people have received their second shot. That's 0.6% of the world's population. Again, an incredibly small number. The US is the fifth fastest country, not the first, but the fifth. In the United States, 14% of the population or 45 million people have received their first shot. And 6 million people, 6%, apologies, or 21 million people have received both shots. But we also see differences between the states. So take Alaska, for example, people living in Alaska have 21% of people living in Alaska have received their first shot. Compare that to about 10% of people in Washington, DC, where I live today. We all know that right now, our biggest challenge for vaccinating more people is the supply bottleneck. The, the, our production of vaccines just cannot keep up with the needed pace. But we also need to think ahead few months ahead of us. So when the supply barrier gets resolved, when that happens, we will be facing barriers to how to get people actually wanting and willing and coming forward to take more vaccines. So the question today is how do we move from theory to actual concrete solutions and to be able to do this in an equitable manner? So that's really why we wanted to bring all of you together today to share ideas, and talk concretely about how we solve this tremendous challenge. With that, I'm honored to introduce our four, four speakers. So first, Dr. Celine Gounder. Celine is practicing infectious disease specialist, internist, and an epidemiologist. In fact, I love this. She calls herself a disease detective. She's been named as one of People Magazine's 25 Women Changing the World. And most recently, Celine served on the Biden-Harris Transition COVID-19 Task Force. Our next panelist is Dr. Heidi Larson. Heidi is an anthropologist and founding director of the Vaccine Confidence Project at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She is an internationally recognized leader working to address global vaccine confidence. So we're really looking to hear Heidi's perspective on the global arena. Her research focuses on the analysis of social and political factors that affect uptake of health interventions and influence policies. And her interest is centered on risk, rumor management, and on building public trust. Also joining us today is Dr. Sandra Quinn. Sandra is professor and chair of the Department of Family Science and senior associate director of the Maryland Center of Health Equity at the School of Public Health at the University of Maryland. She's a renowned expert on the topic of vaccine hesitancy and health disparities. Our fourth panelist is Dr. Michael Holsworth. Michael serves as Managing Director at the Behavioral Insights Team, Orbit North America. He has been a leading figure in developing the field of applying behavioral science to health, 
and he works very closely with governments in developing localized policy solutions. Thank you so much, Celine, Heidi, Sandra, and Michael for joining us today. We're so excited to have you. We're going to start the exciting part of our conversation um, with our panelists. I do want to note that we will open up questions from our audience in the final portion of our conversation today. Please post your question via the Q&A function that you have, and we'll do our best to answer all of them. So let's start our, our questions um, that I would like to pose to our guests. Um, my first question, and I'd like to give each of you about a minute or two um, to answer this. My first question is, if we want to be successful in vaccinating Americans quickly, safely, and equitably, and knowing that our resources are limited, what should be our first priority? Heidi, over to you first. Heidi, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Um, I think our first priority is to really understand uh, where we're not getting, uh, where we're getting the least traction with people based on, we've had many, many surveys. We have also a lot of understanding of the, the populations that are uh, less uh, willing. And I think it, we really have to engage. We need to really prioritize, but also put that in the context of other needs. We, we really have to make sure we don't have a vaccine only approach uh, with engaging communities because their lives are, are faced with so many other risks right now that we really need to put that in context. Thank you, Heidi, for that perspective. Celine, I'm curious to hear from you. Yeah, I think there's been a lot of talk about how do you leverage trusted messengers? And I feel like that's almost become a cliche, a uh, riding on the coattails of the people in communities who've really done the work. And, and while it's really important to engage with them, I think there needs to be uh, evidence that the government, that the um, health sector is trustworthy. And I think this uh, relates to some of what Heidi was alluding to, that it's not just about addressing, well, we need you to come in to get vaccinated, uh, because if you don't care about the whole of that person, the whole of that community, why should they trust that you actually have their best interests at heart? Um, and so I think you really need to be addressing all of the things that uh, promote health and wellness in those communities. Uh, some of that could be, um, you know, people being able to get by during this, uh, the economic crisis related to the pandemic. And, and so I think from a Biden administration perspective, the American Rescue Plan really does try to address some of those other economic and, and social needs that also need to be addressed simultaneously. Thank you, Celine. Sandra, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this question. Well, I would say ditto to my colleagues who have spoken. Um, and I think we also have to do a couple of things as we get more, you know, vaccine supply is we have really not both at the local level and state level address the fact that we are have been overly reliant on technology as a way to have people get access to the vaccine, which disadvantages, you know, low income people, certainly many older adults and rural communities. So I think rethinking the systems that we have there so that it does not take you know, the ability to sit in front of your computer for three hours every day to get a vaccine. So I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is we're seeing you know, across the country and understandably so is you know, these local and state health departments have limited resources. It's why we need the American Rescue Plan, right? But I think the other thing is really thinking much more strategically about where we place these vaccine clinics. And as the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is approved, hopefully this weekend, you know, that will help with that. So the placement, you know, uh, as you may have heard in DC where they're doing this in some black churches. So I think really moving this out to places people can get to without a car, you know, is, is vital. So we can't, from my perspective, just focus on changing the hearts and minds of people. We have to change our systems to enable them to get the vaccine. 
Thank you, Sandra. And Michael, over to you. Yeah, thanks. My point was actually very similar to Sandra's in that we're going to talk about messaging later and messaging is very important, but it can only get you some of the way there. Um, what may be even more important is ease, the kind of friction that's built into the process. We know from um, behavioral psychology that uh, the ease with which you can do something can have a disproportionately large effect whether someone actually performs that behavior. So we need to be looking really closely about even small barriers that we are creating in the process of being able to get a vaccine and try to remove those barriers. I think that's where you could have a lot of impact um, and perhaps we're not thinking about that enough right now. Fantastic. I love these answers because it touches on so many things that we want to dive deeper in during our conversation, right? How we design the system, how we engage the community, how we think of a holistic approach beyond just the delivery of the vaccine, and how do we think about prioritization and messaging and, and ease. So there's just so much food for thought there, and I'm, I'm looking forward to diving deeper into each of these. Um, so I, I do want to step back and kind of take a big picture approach before we, we dive deeper um, you know, into, into these um, questions. And I do want to start, Sandra, with asking you, you know, you have been working for decades uh, on immunization and vaccination campaigns. And I'm, I'm curious to hear from you how the COVID vaccination challenge is any different or similar to other ones that you've worked on. So take H1N1, for example, or, or any other ones that you've worked on or HPV. And what can we learn from those campaigns that we've been running for decades, right? COVID, we're trying to vaccinate everyone in a year, those we've been running for decades. And what mistakes do you feel we're, we are making um, that we shouldn't be making and that we've known for a long time of how to solve? So I'd love to hear your perspective. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because there are similarities and there are distinct differences. And so I think that one of the things we've known for a long time is that we've had disparities in vaccine acceptance. And we often tend to focus on, um, can, we, um, can we communicate better, which is important. We tend to focus less on the systems that might help us facilitate that acceptance and changing provider behavior, for example, or access issues. But I, you know, I think to much of my work around flu vaccine disparities, and they come down to many of the same issues we're dealing with today. You know, um, perceived safety of the vaccine, um, the perceived side effects of the vaccine, the distrust in the system, or, you know, I, I, I found that having trust in the vaccine process is important, yet we have this brand new process, you know, of the vaccine clinical trials followed by EUA, emergency use authorizations, which most of the public doesn't understand. So, and, and we've also found that there are some things that are, that are also important, social norms are important. So I think what is different today let's say then let's do H1N1, our last pandemic that we experienced in the United States. And that was after the initial urgency in like April, May into June, what happened was we ultimately approved a vaccine under usual mechanisms, okay? The usual flu vaccine mechanism. We did have a separate vaccine, but it was done the same way. Secondly, it was not a severe pandemic, fortunately. So over time, you know, there began to be sort of less urgency on the part of the public and to some extent providers even on pushing forward with H1N1. What is different now is the urgency, if anything, continues to grow. And that is, and yet we have, as you've seen in some of Sergo's research, you know, very different perspectives on how people see that. So I think, you know, thinking very consciously about all the things we've just described and then thinking about what has worked from the past, you know, changing social norms, creating the systems, getting providers really to be strong recommenders and role models. Some of the things we know work from the past are critical now 
but dealing with that urgency and the ongoing uncertainty as the variants continue to be, you know, uncovered. And as we learn more and more about the impact of the vaccines over time and their, inner, their effectiveness against the variants, all of those things mean we're dealing with ongoing uncertainty. And I think that issue is going to be a serious challenge and priority for us to address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting. The the ongoing uncertainty, which is really the backdrop of this whole of this whole pandemic uh, and this vaccination campaign. With that, I, I'd like to turn to Celine. Um, you know, Celine, you've served on the Biden Harris Transition COVID Task Force. Uh, I'm sure a big part of uh, government response is tackling uncertainty. Um, so I'm curious. Um, can you share? I'd love to hear, and I'm sure our our audience would love to hear. Can you share how the administration was thinking about the challenge when you were on this task force or how they're thinking about it now? And specifically what types of solutions were being, are being prioritized um, for this campaign from the administration's perspective? So I, I think about this um, in a couple different uh, buckets. So you have the supply issues, you have the distribution and access issues, and then you have the acceptance or, or demand side. Uh, in terms of supply, that is ramping up. Uh, we uh, are looking at, with the increase in supply from Pfizer and Moderna, we're looking at up to uh, four to five million doses being manufactured per day by the end of next month. Uh, we have been, um, uh, or Johnson & Johnson has also submitted, as we know, their vaccine for an FDA emergency use authorization as well. That would also dramatically increase supply. Right now, we're on trend um, to have 600 million doses of Pfizer plus Moderna available by the end of July, plus another 100 million doses of Johnson & Johnson. And, and that is more than enough to vaccinate every American who wants to be vaccinated. So supply is dramatically shrinking as a, as a challenge here. Um, some of the other uh, challenges with the current vaccines are the deep freeze requirements of the Pfizer vaccine, but now that the FDA is going to, um, uh, Pfizer has submitted data to the FDA about uh, the vaccine stability at higher temperatures at sort of the normal uh, refrigerator freezer temperatures, not these deep freezers, uh, and that the vaccine does remain stable um, at, at more typical storage temperatures, that also really does uh, simplify the distribution process because it doesn't have to, uh, you don't need that ultra cold cold chain. Uh, you don't need to be centralizing um, the distribution out of, say, big academic medical centers or hospitals or other facilities that have that kind of capacity. Um, so that's also going to simplify distribution. And then you have uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which also does not require such ultra cold uh, uh, storage, and then is also a one dose vaccine as opposed to a two dose vaccine, which again also simplifies your distribution. So um, some of those supply issues are, are really um, being resolved at this point. Uh, in terms of distribution, you have some other major challenges. Uh, I think bioinformatics, so our tech systems and public health cannot be underestimated as a major problem. There's been tremendous underinvestment in public health in this country for decades, uh, not least of which is in our, our tech systems, our labs, and our people. And when um, you know, people ask, well, why is it that we're not collecting data, for example, on uh, race and ethnicity, our occupation, on people who are getting vaccinated, a lot of that goes back to, do you have the tech systems that allow you to do that? Uh, mm -hmm. There was outrage um, about the vaccine, um, vaccine that's meant for certain zip codes uh, being administered to people from outside those zip codes. But you need systems that are efficient that allow you to do that triaging if you truly want to do that. And otherwise you're putting public health workers on the front lines who by the way are not the white privileged people. These are people from the community. You're asking them to enforce uh, these, these rules when somebody comes and you know, says, I have an appointment for a vaccine. You're putting them in a very difficult situation. They're already understaffed. They've been under attack for months uh, over some of the mitigation measures. And so I think we're asking a lot of these very um, frontline healthcare workers uh, to be trying to enforce this without the system. So we really do need to have much better 
bioinformatics systems um, in place to allow for, for a rollout of vaccination like this. And then finally, I think, um, you know, thinking about how do you improve access in some of these in these communities, um, you know, I think there's been a very intentional effort under the new administration to target vaccination um, to the most vulnerable communities. Uh, some of that has been done through the retail pharmacy program. So it's not opened up to all retail pharmacies. They've really tried to uh, start uh, that rollout with pharmacies located in um, the CDC uh, social vulnerability index uh, highest risk uh, areas. And so that is one way to do that. Another way that the administration is, is looking at doing that is through uh, federally qualified health centers, which are community health centers embedded in some of the uh, most underserved, most vulnerable communities, whether that's communities of color or certain rural areas. And so that's another important piece of this. And then uh, finally, the FEMA uh, mass vaccination centers are being located in, again, vulnerable areas where there are gaps in access. Um, and so trying to address some of the, those gaps through these mass vaccination centers as well. Um, so I think, you know, there's a, there's a range of different um, uh, of approaches that are being used to improve access um, in an equitable fashion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Celine. It, it's, um, I like how you framed it, systems distribution and, and demand and, and getting that view of the federal government is really helpful. So at the end of the day, all of this, all of this comes down to communities, local communities that actually have to make this happen. Um, Michael, you've been working very closely with mayors across um, cities in the United States. So I'm curious to hear from you, what is their perspective? What kind of challenges they're facing and how are they gearing up um, to the local implementation of all of these programs? Yeah, thanks. Um, so in terms of um, the city's role, we uh, have done two main things. One is to run a series of trials, um, just to work out what messages are most effective um, in terms of communicating about the vaccines um, and increasing confidence. And I'll talk about those later maybe, because I think there is a particular role that um, mayors can play. And we talk about a few different functions. One is understand. So in terms of understanding what the concerns are in your particular city and the communities in that city. Another one is amplify. So in other words, talk about the practical steps those uh, who are eligible to get a vaccine, repeat those messages, um, because we know that increases the effectiveness of the messages, um, direct people to other sources of information. We talked about um, trusted messengers. The mayor or the city leader may not be the best place to, to be the messenger for all aspects. So you need to have a clear message about where you should be going for other information. Reassure. So, you know, talk about um, addressing the concerns that may have come out, but also talk about the kind of procedural fairness of the of the process. So people really care about what's called procedural fairness. You may not get a vaccine straight away, but you want to know that there has been a fair process for allocating those vaccines. So to explain how uh, the, the distribution is going is also a really important function. Mm -hmm. And then finally, role models. So there may be a tension between, you know, appearing to jump the line. So you don't want uh, leaders to seem to be getting it um, uh, when they, they're not allowed to. But there should be, I think, a, a role for the mayor to get um, the vaccine relatively earlier on as an important part of the city's uh, leadership and infrastructure. And when you do that as a mayor, Make it visible, you know, use different media to show you've done it and that is a good thing. People said that they were looking for that kind of role modeling as well from their, their leaders. So those kind of things around understand, amplify, direct, reassure and role model are some of the core actions that, that leaders can be taking. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna pull it back up again and, and um, move to Heidi. So Heidi, you have, this incredible global perspective. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious to hear, I'm, I'm gonna get to vaccine hesitancy in, in, in a minute and, and talk about your work in that space. But I'm curious to hear from you since you've been uh, working with a lot of governments actually around the world and specifically in Africa and the Africa CDC, the issues that we're facing here and the types of solutions that we're talking about here, are those 
common? Are those similar um, in other countries? Or do you see different types of issues or different types of solutions? And essentially, what can we learn from each other? Well, when it comes to Africa, they're not right at the point of deciding uh, trying to get everyone in, the, you know, equity within their populations because most of the countries haven't even gotten any vaccines. So, um, on the other hand, there's there's a different side of that that I was on a panel with a colleague at WHO Afro, the, the regional uh, WHO office, who was saying that um, despite the um, the stress, as it were, the tension about whether or not or when they'll get their vaccines. Uh, because even this global COVAX facility, it, it's going to take a little while, and even then it's only 20% of their, the, the needs. Um, but she said, you know, we can use this, and I, I would totally agree with her from our Ebola vaccine experience. She said, we need to use that time before we get it to build confidence in the public. And one of the ways that confidence is building is by Africa seeing um, the US, Europe, other countries taking millions of people getting this vaccine. And, and there's been no uh, kind of very serious adverse event. And it, it's given some level of confidence that it's not Africa being tried first to see if it works and then going, that there's been a good spinoff about seeing a lot. And she said what's even would will be even more compelling is when we see Black communities getting their vaccination, that will be the real builder. And it was interesting that she kind of, I mean, I, I had thought about the, the more you vaccinate, the more confidence, but, but I think that different countries are at different stages. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety about when and when they'll get it, but also there's, um, we're going into a stage where, you know, there was one vaccine and not then two, and there will be a few more coming down the pipeline. And, and a lot of times people aren't talking about Sputnik and, and the Corona vaccine from China. I mean, people tend to talk about AstraZeneca, uh, which Pfizer, Moderna, and j and which are the ones that we talk about because they're the ones we're likely to use. But there are other vaccines out there and there are a lot of, uh, players in the manufacturing. India is making a lot of vaccines. Um, other countries are. So it's, a, it's been a, a very um, important and yet ex time of exposing geopolitical relations as well as, as, as access. But I hope we get this right because this is gonna be a, a time that people remember, were we left out or weren't we? because it's going to stick. Yeah, I think the way the way you frame it, it's the, we're all interconnected, right? What's happening in the here in the US, I think you've said this before, actually really matters to what's happening in Africa or elsewhere and vice versa. Yeah. And, and, and with that, I'd love to hear Sandra's <laughs> perspective, because Sandra, I know you've been working um, quite a bit with communities of color in Maryland. And so how are you seeing that confidence actually um, shift, if at all, in those communities and, and what has been working? I appreciate Heidi's comment about the reflection of, of her colleague from WHO Africa about seeing Black communities in the United States and other places getting vaccinated will also, you know, have an impact on confidence. Um, you know, it's been interesting. We work a lot with African American communities here in the Washington D.C. region, and you know, since last spring, we've been doing periodically um, doing town halls and other activities um, virtually, of course. Um, but you know, we heard early on much of what we might have expected. There's no way we're going to take this vaccine. We don't want to be guinea pigs. We don't trust the government. You know, things that for many of us are concerns about Tuskegee and the legacy of Tuskegee. So for many of us who work with these communities for a long time, there weren't big surprises there. But here's what we're starting to see happen over time. And number one is that there's a shift. I mean, certainly there are some that still remain in you know, that wait and see camp. But we've also seen shifts. We work in some local barber shops and the barbers who initially were saying, 
no way, no way, are saying, where do I sign up? And then what happens is they're saying that very publicly to their clients. And so we are seeing a shift and we're seeing a shift from, I won't do it to seeing, you know, certainly local black leaders, national figures, Tyler Perry did a really excellent show a couple of weeks ago on the vaccine, but also seeing, um, you know, um, pastors, community leaders, some of the first people vaccinated in the US um, locally and across the country have been, you know, black healthcare workers who said, I want my community to understand this. So it's shifting and it's shifting much more to I'm interested. And I think that actually the extent to which we still acknowledge people have reasons to distrust that are legitimate and then talk about the impact of what they're seeing around them, you know, in terms of people's deaths and the impact on their families. So I'm actually more hopeful than I was six months ago, but it takes community partners working with trusted public health and, and health leaders to, to make this come about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sandra, we talk a lot about trust within um, Black and African American communities. Do you see other, other barriers that stand in the way for this community to be able to get vaccinated? Or do you think predominantly it's a trust issue? No, I think there are other issues, some of which we've talked about earlier too. I mean, there is access, both real and perceived. So if you have to get in a car to go to the big Six Flags amusement park in Prince George's County to get your vaccine, not everyone can do that. If you have to take off work in the middle of the day to do it, not everyone can do that. There are certainly perceptions of cost, you know, and whether those actually end up, you know, being uh, worn out. You know, when I got my vaccine, I had, I was, as for no insurance card, but people perceive costs to be a barrier. So I think where these are placed, are they in federally qualified health centers? Are they in, in local practices, the community pharmacy, so I can walk down the street? So I think there are real sort of logistic barriers. And can I negotiate even getting the appointment that we talked about earlier? Um, and I think as we solve some of those, it will actually help us with the trust issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of things to think about at the same time. I, I do want to move to this concept of vaccine hesitancy because a lot of the, the media and a lot of what's being written uh, when it comes to COVID-19, there's a lot talked about vaccine hesitancy. And, and Heidi, uh, I've been following your work for, for a long time, and you were one of the first to sound the alarm bells of vaccine hesitancy. Um, speci specifically in low and middle income countries, right? Um, which is, is a relatively newish phenomena. Um, I'd like to hear from you, what parallels are you seeing between vaccine, well, first of all, how do you define vaccine hesitancy? And then what parallels do you see between what's happening here in America uh, and what's happening in, in other countries? Thanks. Um... Well, in terms of what is vaccine hesitancy, we've chosen the, the framework of vaccine confidence um, because you have the spectrum of zero confidence to 100% confidence. And I would situate hesitancy somewhere in the middle there. It's a state of undecidedness uh, and it may be only about one vaccine. Maybe you have no problem with other vaccines, but there's one that you have an anxiety about or concern about, or maybe just an ingredient in one of them, but, or maybe it's, it's more of them. Sometimes it's an issue of schedules, you know, too many too soon with kids. Um, in the case of the, um, in the COVID vaccine, it's also been an issue of too fast, you know, <laughs> can't be safe. Um, and we heard that a lot around H1N1, even though it was a much more familiar, yeah, typical seasonal influenza um, vaccine, which H1N1 was a, an, an added strain, but H1N1 wasn't even a new virus. I mean, it was the, you know, we had been reminded about it many times for reflecting on 1918, but this is brand new at so many levels. And I think that creates some anxiety. 
I have a bit of, I'm not a big fan of the term hesitancy. I think it just, you know, it sends too much of a negative tone. I think confidence, you know, I tend to talk about low confidence or higher confidence because it feels more movable. <laughs> Um, and I don't think we should, I mean, I've read some things to say we have to stop hesitancy. Actually, I think hesitancy is a responsible thing to a certain extent. I think a little bit of hesitancy is maybe, you know, particularly with first time parents or some even in the context of COVID, it's important to ask some questions. I mean, I, I wish sometimes some people would ask more questions because it's, it's an opportunity to talk more about these things. So I think we have to kind of rethink how we use that term. It's been, and so it often gets jumbled up with um, refusal too, which, you know, by nature, it's a state of, un which is particularly rampant with this hyper uncertainty. Um, I think we have to have, I mean, in my new book, Stuck, uh, one of the chapters is really talking about the importance of empathy and the importance of dignity um, you know, respect people's questions, respect their perspective. Um, and we're so quick to judge and say, oh, that's silly. Um, I mean, as a, as a medical community and even something like that, people feel like their feelings are being dismissed or ignored. And I think now more than ever, we have to be um, empathetic and caring with, with that. So um, I wouldn't, uh, I'd be, somebody comes to me and say, I'm a bit hesitant, I would say, well, let's talk about it, <laughs> you know. Um, anyway, on the global front, uh, this issue of, you know, hesitancy or, or less confidence about the vaccine is a global issue. And frankly, a lot of the issues are pretty similar. There, you know, the one about too new too quick is definitely a global one. Um, I think, um, in some places of the world, they don't even believe that COVID exists. They think it's made up. It's, you know, all the symptoms could be other things. This is, you know, for those who are um, suspicious um, and why, if you don't believe something exists, why would you even bother thinking? It, you don't get as far as even thinking about taking a vaccine. So you're not hesitant. You're just, it's not relevant. Um, so I think, and those we see that in some of some of the more extreme groups um, uh, in the U.S. and and global, but it plays out differently in different settings. And I really appreciated what Sandra was said was talking about, you know, the emotions going up and down, the sense of an emergency, different perceptions of risk. I mean, in any of these surveys, they're changing all the time, and it's also reflective of the state of the epidemic. People aren't, people do bring a bit of reason in. What's my perceived threat right now mm -hmm. or not? <laughs> Just Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think Michael, that. please. Yeah, I was actually uh, gonna call you out here. <laughs> I just want to really um, pick up the point around listening and empathy because I think it's incredibly important um, for two, two reasons. One, because it's important in its own terms, in terms of uh, people's uh, dignity and understanding what is happening and, as I believe Professor Lars has pointed out in the past, it may be that this, this idea of hesitancy or concern about a, a vaccine is not actually about the vaccine. It's about other factors that have happened in the past that people are thinking about in terms of how they feel they've been treated. Um, and that's that's being almost uh, put onto the, the question of the vaccine. But also there's a practical reason for, for listening, which is, um, you're not going to um, change someone's mind by going in there and uh, attempting to convince them through an argument that you, you've come up with. You need a process of listening first and responding to the concerns rather than coming in with your set um, view on how to, to convince people on the facts. That's, that's not going to be an effective approach. And there's quite a lot of work that's been do, done recently around countering this information um, and how not to do it uh, and how not to is go in there with your facts and attempt to um, beat someone's submission with them. That does not work. So I, I the idea of empathy and, and listening is really important as, as you know, you both state. So who should be listening? I'm really curious about that. Like, who are we talking about when we're saying should be listening to people's concerns? 
Well, I mean, I would start with the, the healthcare provider or the person that they're asking. I mean, whoever it is, actually. I mean, I get people saying to me, you know, all kinds of people like, you know, I was at dinner with somebody the other night and this was a friend of mine. And how do I deal with the fact that her views are so different from mine to people in a doctor's office to, I mean, it's become so society wide, this issue, it's, uh, which is really striking to me that I would say whoever, whoever, wherever the topic comes up, don't save it for the doctor's office. <laughs> I, and and I would I would both agree with that and say I've been doing a lot of um, webinars with primary care providers, public health nurses, nurse managers, and some of the systems in Maryland, particularly, but elsewhere too. And so we we literally walk through um, everything from you know the the you know the importance of empathy, encouraging questions, not considering hesitancy refusal but considering maybe it's a healthy skepticism in this environment we're in and but also then we walk through literally you know how to prepare themselves for things like it's too fast so we talk about why the trials went fast and how that worked what the independence of the the bodies that were um from the uh Data Safety Monitoring Board to the BRPAC um, um, External Advisory Board for FDA, et cetera. We talk about the myths about uh, the platforms, the mRNA platforms. We talk about, you know, a whole array of the, th the question that we hear in our barbershops is, you know, where people are Black and, and, and Latino are, were people like me in it? But you can also hear that from older people. So we literally walk through, how would you respond to these questions? What's, what are the facts that you might have in your hip pocket when somebody says, you know, but it was too fast? Or I don't think people like me were in it, you know, so how do I know it's safe for me? So on the provider side, I've been doing a lot of that kind of talk and with them and I'm amazed at both number one um, you know these are people who are busy in their primary care practice and all are they're not infectious disease specialists you know and so they may not even know sort of all of the, the details of how this moved quickly and what it means and um, so I'm finding from them that they're saying well I had no idea this is really helpful to me so it's giving them tools it's helping them have some tools mm -hmm. Elaine, I'm like, curious to hear from yeah you. I'd like to jump in on some of that so I, I think to Michael's point very often you know these expressions of um, vaccine was developed too fast or uh, was it tested on people like me um, I think some of that is 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 real. Some of it's shorthand for something deeper. I think same thing with Tuskegee. It's really shorthand for something deeper. And so if you just try to counter specifically with that one question, you know, with facts, that doesn't address that sort of deeper problem. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that's really important to to note here. And it really is about you know, for example, with with Tuskegee as an example. Um, that's not a one incident in time. There is centuries of history of enslavement and using of bodies and land, and not just for Black Americans. Another major group um, that has real uh, concerns is, is the indigenous community, which I think sometimes gets left out of, of, of the conversation. Uh, and there's no, it's not a coincidence that the uh, degree of um, anxiety about vaccination is higher among Black Americans and, indi and Indigenous Americans, uh, in contrast, frankly, to, to Latinx communities and, and white communities. Um, and, and so I think it's important to recognize that history, that some of these things are continuing to happen now. If you are a Black American and you're admitted to the hospital, your chances of ending up on a teaching service, so a resident-run service where you have less uh, supervision, more resident autonomy is much, it's much higher if you're a black American. And, and so, you know, is that equitable uh, healthcare now? Uh, you know, and that's just one example. 
Um, so I think it's really important to, to acknowledge some of that. Um, you know, and, and Heidi and I have both worked in Guinea. Um, you know, if you have those conversations, you start to understand there's, there's more to it than that. So, um, you know, they would say things like Ebola is not real, just like people now say, you know, COVID's not real. And it was really, um, th there was also this expression, Ebola business. And so it was really an expression of, well, you are here as Westerners, you're getting paid by your NGO, your relief organization. It's a business. It's how these organizations support themselves. They get grants to go out and do this work. And once Ebola disappears, you guys are all gonna you know, leave and, and you're not really gonna stick it out and help us build our health systems in the long term. Well, guess what? They were right. And mm -hmm. it's so interesting now, we have a resurgence of uh, Ebola in, in Delecoe, which is the um, forest region of Guinea, and you're having the same conversations all over again, that Ebola is not real. And so also, I think you see a similar, um, there's something similar here going on with vaccination of why do you care if I'm getting vaccinated if you really don't care about my health in any other context? Mm -hmm. Oh, you must, just, you must just care about herd immunity. And it's not really for me and my community that you're, you're doing this. And so I think, you know, again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier in the conversation, which is that you need to be thinking more broadly about the social and economic needs of these communities and not just in this tunnel vision way about vaccination. Thank you, Celine. That, that's, that's such an important point. And I think that applies to a lot of public health programs where we get so focused on kind of the moment and the medical solution, but lose kind of the bigger ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, so we have about five minutes before we turn to the audience uh, Q&A. Um, but I want to shift to Michael, because I know, Michael, you have been doing some really, really interesting experiments. I want to shift to solutioning. We've talked about solutioning already, but really generating evidence to what works uh, in terms of getting more people to accept the vaccine. And so I would love to hear from you in terms of the work you've been doing um, in the cities. Absolutely. So I'll give you a brief overview. Um, we have been looking at what messages might be more effective at communicating about the vaccine and running uh, trials to see how people react to different uh, approaches. Um, we both ran um, studies, these were online because the only feasible way of doing this quickly enough, but involved 30,000 people from across the US. In parallel, we ran 15 focus groups um, with uh, groups of particularly at risk to understand uh, their perspectives and um, how they were seeing the issues. And, Ultimately, we, we identified four messages which um, increased um, confidence uh, and willingness to, to receive the vaccine in randomized trials. Uh, the four are, one is around the fact that getting the vaccine means you can help, help your loved ones to, you know, your loved ones need you, um, you can be there for them, uh, vaccine helps you do that. Um, and that, that came out quite strongly in terms of People, when people said um, their reasons for getting vaccinated, the first one was um, to help their family, protect their family. Second approach is around this idea of getting our lives back again. Of course, for so many people, we can't get back to normal. We're not saying that, but it, you can return to some aspects of your life that have been impossible for the last uh, year. And so this talks about, um, you know, uh, now we have the chance to return to the people and places we love. Let's get our lives back again, sign up to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, that actually came out very strongly from focus groups as a motivation uh, for, for the vaccine. Um, third approach was around using healthcare um, professionals as messengers. Uh, this has been talked about before. The idea here is that there's a kind of consistency between what um, healthcare workers are saying in terms of getting the vaccine and that them getting the vaccine themselves. So they're, they're following through on their recommendations. Of course, there is hesitancy among healthcare workers themselves. Maybe we can talk about that in a second, but the majority uh, of people have in that group have uh, received the vaccine. So it's talking about how they've, they've got it and they recommend you do too. Um, people were saying, well, we incorporated a survey element that in terms of increasing confidence about vaccine, doctors were by far the uh, most trusted messengers. Um, 
And that was particularly true in the Spanish language trials that we, we ran as well. Um, and then finally, um, the final message talks about confidence uh, and tries to talk about you know, two main things. One is that there was a, a rigorous process to test the vaccines. You know, 70,000 people uh, got them. Uh, we calculate this on the Moderna or Pfizer trials when we developed the message. But also that you know, tens of millions of people have now got the vaccine and this can increase your confidence. So you're, you're talking both about the, the kind of checks that were involved, but also the kind of social proof. Um, you know, people are more convinced about uh, doing things when they've seen others uh, do that first. And there's a separate um, uh, piece of research that's been done, which I think is really great, which shows that if you do talk about the number of people who receive the vaccine, that does increase confidence. Some people have been concerned that if you did that, you might get kind of free riding. So the fact that so many other people have got it means I don't need to. That doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, you get an improvement. And so for all these four messages, um, we saw improvement in confidence around three to four percentage points. That's compared to people who didn't see any message. And you may say, oh, does just like any message work then? That's not what we found. We ran previous rounds of trials and we found that some messages backfire as well. Um, talking about side effects in a superficial way reduces confidence in the vaccine, even though you're trying to reassure people. And involving politics in the messaging reduces confidence and willingness. Um, three to four percentage points um, in the United States, for example, that's around 10 million more people uh, getting the vaccine. You know, in, a, in a city of, say, half a million people, that's around 20,000 people more. And that could make the difference between reaching a kind of community immunity threshold and not. So that's a meaningful change by just looking at the kind of messaging you use. That's my short summary. I'll kind of leave it there and, and happy to take questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Michael. I mean, that's just with messaging. I and mean, ima imagine all the other auxiliary interventions in the system that could be rolled out. They will all reinforce each other. So I'm being told that we have a lot of questions from audience. So we're going to move to audience Q&A here. Um, the first question, um, I'm going to read this out. Um, with states that are vaccinating people with comorbidities, some people are being asked to provide a doctor's note. Does this seem like an unnecessary obstacle to you? How do you suggest states juggle the need to facilitate vaccines for the most vulnerable while ensuring that that ent entrepreneuring people who are not vulnerable don't jump in line because there are no obstacles at all. So um, anyone who wants to jump in on this question. Well, I think this is where um, you can't just have distribution of vaccines through primary care clinics and hospital systems because those systems are really gonna serve people who are already plugged in, who already have a primary care provider, who already have insurance, who already have access. Uh, and, and so, you know, for somebody um, who does not have uh, insurance or maybe Medicaid and, and they don't have a primary care provider, um, that in and of itself is gonna be an obstacle. Um, so I, I think we need to be, um, uh, on the one hand, if you are a primary care provider, you should probably be actively reaching out. In fact, I was just um, having a conversation with somebody here in New York, uh, the Department of Health about this earlier today of, you know, is there a, an effort to reach out to primary care providers um, to let their patients know, hey, you have a chronic medical condition, here is documentation you can take in when you make your appointment. I don't know that there are coordinated efforts to, to do that kind of thing right now, but that clearly needs to be part of the solution. But when we know, um, I, I can't stat, quote the stats to you exactly, but more than, more than half of Americans don't have primary care doctors. So if you don't have a regular provider that you see who can document those chronic medical conditions, you're, you know, you're obviously going to need some other way uh, of accessing vaccination. And we know that communities of color are going to be even more unlikely to have that um, access and that documentation, and yet they have higher rates of uh, many of these chronic medical conditions. So I think this speaks to the need to have, for example, distribution through local retail pharmacies in those communities to be 
uh, leveraging FQHCs perhaps to do some outreach, um, health fair kind of things where they're also screening for these chronic medical conditions and then getting people referred for vaccination. And then the use of these FEMA sites. Um, again, you know, trying, trying to couple some of these interventions together uh, in those kinds of sites. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Celine. I had a follow-up question on the FEMA sites, actually. I mean, this is a state-by-state state decision, or is this being rolled out nationally? And what is the scale of this? How accessible are they? Is there like a few sites in a given place? Or if you can talk a little bit more. Yeah, so that's federal. So this is really a federal um, response to gaps in uh, access in different parts of the country. By and large, you're going to see those um, in uh, the areas that have been identified by the CDC through their social vulnerability index as being higher risk. Um, you might see that also, for example, um, in a rural area where the nearest health provider who can really do vaccination might be a couple hours away. Um, and so the, the role of the FEMA mass vaccination sites is really to fill some of those critical gaps that other providers are not meeting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, our next question. We are seeing exactly what Dr. Quinn is saying, that vaccine hesitancy isn't as much of a problem as we anticipated. The real issue is access. What is the administration doing to support non-traditional delivery methods? How do we push beyond technology platforms to get people signed up? And I know, Celine, you touched a bit on this, and I was wondering if there were other perspectives or anything else um, our panelists wanted to add. I, sorry, um, so, I didn't, Celine, were you going to say something? No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I, I wouldn't jump to the, it's about access, not about hesitancy, because it depends who you are and where you live. And I think it's, um, it's generalizes too much and it also changes. I mean, right now people are thinking about access because we have a shortage. And I don't think we should um, let that mask, you know, I've heard some people say, oh, we were so folk concerned about hesitancy, but really our problem is not enough vaccines for all the people who want it. Well, maybe this week, because, you know, the people who reported being hesitant are still hesitant, but we haven't gotten to them yet. Um, it, you know, the ages are still you know, the highest risk groups and, you know, we have limited supply, which always makes people feel like if they can't have it, they want it more. Um, yeah, I always used to think that should be a strategy to say, sorry, you can't have it, you know, <laughs> see what happens then. But I mean, when we start getting more flows of vaccines and starting to get, so I would just urge thinking about it as being both, but, and that ratio depends on who you are and where you live. Yeah, and sort of to, to piggyback on what Heidi just said, um, I think the group where you can see that most clearly is among healthcare workers because their barriers to access, it's not to say there are none, uh, but their barriers to access are minimal compared to the general population. And the fact that we still see lack of confidence in the vaccines among healthcare workers, that uptake among, again, black and indigenous healthcare workers has been lower. Um, is a sign that this is not just an access issue. And I've actually worked with some researchers um, with the COVID States Project. So they're based out of um, a couple of universities in, in Boston, as well as uh, Northwestern uh, and NYU. And they, um, at my, um, sort of at my encouragement, did a survey recently as part of their series of surveys, focusing specifically on healthcare workers and why they had less confidence. And it really tracks with the demographics of people more broadly in the general population who are less confident. So uh, women were less confident than men. And I think that may relate to some of the disinformation around fertility and the vaccine. Um, and there has not, to be clear, there's not been any evidence that there's any risk of infertility associated with the vaccine or any risk to lactating or pregnant women. Uh, and then the other groups that are less confident are Black healthcare workers, um, they were not, they didn't have enough of a sample size to speak to indigenous healthcare workers in this particular survey. Uh, and, and then people who had lower educational um, status and, and were um, paid, uh, were, were uh, paid less. And so I think that really speaks to um, people are people. They're not just healthcare workers. They, they are embedded in communities. 
the, um, the history of that community, the politics of that community influences their thinking just as much as their exposure to science and medicine in the health profession. And, and frankly, if anything, because of some of what they may bear witness to in terms of ongoing inequities, that may reinforce some of those very, um, you know, um, hesitancies, uh, anxieties about the safety of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Celine, that's really interesting. We actually ran two national surveys with healthcare workers um, to understand the levels of intention and uptake. And in our first survey in December, we found 15% overall were not willing, and that declined to 11% by February. But as you mentioned, it was much higher among communities of color. It was also much higher among healthcare workers working in long-term fac resident facilities. Um, and so there are definitely um, pockets within even the healthcare worker population where this is an issue that needs to be tackled uh, directly. So, so that's really interesting to see. Um, Can I come uh, in and, and, yes. and respond to something that built on what the two of you have just said too? I mean, and, and I'll work on um, vaccine disparities around flu. You know, what we did was really create a, a set of measures of racial fairness in healthcare racial consciousness, the extent to which you're conscious of your race when you're in the healthcare setting, discrimination in healthcare. And, you know, not surprisingly, and this speaks to both, you know, the patient's experience, but also the provider's experience. If you feel like you're being treated fairly and people like you are being treated fairly, then we saw higher trust in the vaccine and higher uptake. If you were more conscious of your race in a healthcare setting, then often what we saw was there was less trust in the vaccine, more concern about side effects, and certainly discrimination. You know, experience of discrimination contributed to lower trust in the vaccine. So, you know, many of these workers are really, particularly in long term care facilities. You know, they're vulnerable healthcare workers anyhow. They're at the lower, you know, end of the sort of the income scale in those settings. And they may be much less, you know, skilled in terms of formal education. I'm not talking, you know, their actual hands-on skills. So the extent to which they may, in fact, have experienced that bias and, and treatment themselves, but observed it, I just don't think we can ignore those things. Mm -hmm. And that calls for system fixes to the ongoing racial bias we have. Great. Um, thanks, Sandra. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to also look at the questions that are coming in. We have so many questions, which is quite exciting. It's about um, moving along. Okay. Um, so the next question is, we have a question from a provider, uh, which is great. I think this uh, goes well with what we've been talking to. Um, he or she, I don't know, it says, at my clinic, we're sometimes left with one or two doses, but don't know that until 30 minutes before our vaccine site closes. So we need to know that whoever, wh whoever we call to come first, um, is one, number one, sorry, going to answer their phone and two, be available at the moment to get to our site in 15 minutes. Seems like a lot of vaccine sites are getting in trouble for giving doses to not yet eligible people, but also we don't want to waste a single dose. How do we address equitable distribution um, at the end of the day, essentially? So she's talking about the challenge of, of coordination and then doses being left um, because people didn't show up or didn't come out on time. Well, just like I was saying earlier, I think there needs to be outreach by primary care providers to their patient panel to say, um, you know, the, the vaccines are coming, they're here, you have these chronic medical conditions, you know, you could present this letter to a vaccination site, and hey, we're also starting to vaccinate, and at the end of every day, we may have extra doses, uh, be aware that this would be the, you know, time when that might happen at the end of every day and we will be um, you know reaching out or or do you want to be on a list of folks that you know wants to be uh, notified and and you know that sort of thing so I think to be proactive about um, realizing that this might happen and and reach out to your to your patient panel ahead of time to let them know thank you Celine um, next question. How do we make sure that as we scale up vaccination, sorry, we do not 
cannibalize other health services and even some that are still important for COVID. For example, some counties have reported closing COVID testing sites to administer vaccinations. Heidi or Sandra or Michael or Selena. Well, I mean, I that's even within COVID, not even other yeah. health issues. Um, you know, I it's a it's a challenge. Um, but I also think if we um, step back and think about what I was saying in the beginning, which has said again a, a couple times, um, the importance of putting COVID in context, because you know, if you can keep trying to deal with the other health issues, it's going to help the trust building uh, when COVID comes along, because they'll say, well, you know, you made time to help me with my, the pain in my side. Um, maybe I can, maybe you do care about, you know, my well-being. Um, I mean, that's easier to say uh, than when faced with the reality of time and resources. And also, um, you know, because of uh, the nature of distancing and whatever, um, it is uh, yeah, it is a challenge. But I think that systems, you know, we've been talking about when we have the next pandemic for ages. Um, and, you know, there are so many like trial runs and what do they call them when you um, simulations? Simulation. <laughs> I was going to say synchronization. I knew that was wrong. A simulation. Um, you know, we thought we were all ready and we were not all ready. Um, and, you know, what happens if we have a, a, another outbreak of something else? I've been doing work, uh, we're about to roll out co Ebola vaccines for healthcare workers across DRC in the coming months. And we've been planning this for a while. Um, and then came COVID, you know, um, are we ready for two pandemics or you know, a pandemic and oops, an earthquake. Um, uh, the systems have no surge capacity. And I think that if there's one thing we take away from this is that very real, and we lost a professor at the school who couldn't get her cancer treatments and she died because COVID, you know, was taking over everything. It was awful. And so it's, we do need, um, Again, it's much easier to say what should be done um, than, you know, I, I do appreciate um, faced with the reality of it, but I, I think to whatever extent possible, we need to, I mean, Celine, you're, you're on the front lines here. How, how what's the plan? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think to your, for your point about surge capacity, I mean, look what just happened in Texas where they yeah. had, you know, an outage of exactly. power and water. You know, I have family that's been living, that lives in Texas. They've been having to boil their water. Um, you know, it, it shows that we really are not able to deal with simultaneous crises and with, with other changes with climate change and, and some of these other things that are driving uh, the frequency of epidemics of emerging infectious diseases, this is only going to happen more often. I think the other issue, at least in the United States, is we have so underinvested in public health. And since the 2008-2009 recession, we've lost some 50 to 60,000 public health workers across the country. And it's actually why I, I left um, my job at the New York City Department of Health because I was so frustrated by the, the situation of, and how undervalued uh, that work was. Um, and you know, I think what we, so some researchers have estimated if you wanted to really properly staff up public health departments in this country, that would mean hiring some 250,000 additional public health workers across the country. And that's not to mention you know, the bioinformatics tech systems I was talking about earlier and improving our lab capacity to do things like genomic surveillance, you know, to, to surveil for these variants. We don't have, we haven't made those investments. And so, of course, when you're hit with an emergency like this, people are forced to make very difficult decisions, at, you know, as for example, uh, do we vaccinate or do we test when, when you only have so many people and so many resources? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. So I'm going to move to the next question. And, and this is a really interesting question because um, this kind of relates to the news I was reading yesterday, which is about Israel and, um, you know, Israel using green passports for people who are vaccinated to open up the economy. 
Um, so the question is, are there any discussions about vaccine passports or digital health passes that denote vaccine status um, for the US? And if so, how can these be equitable in the face of inequitable access to vaccines? Um, I wanna add something in there and actually um, ask Michael to chip in first because I'm from a behavioral science perspective, Michael, I'd love your perspective on opt-in versus opt-out um, you know, models and, and, and what your perspective is. And then I want also everyone else on the panel to, to answer this question in the equity um, perspective. I mean, I think with, with vaccine passports, if there is inequitable, inequitable access to vaccines, then there will be inequity in distribution of vaccine passports. Um, there is a question, and indeed, I, this is not an, a, a new thing. There's this idea, I believe, in previous pandemics around kind of immunity privilege. Um, I, I don't um, know if this is going to happen. I, I believe it's you know been discussed uh, various times, but the complexities of it and the potential kind of unintended consequences mean that um, I believe that it, I, I'd be interested to see if it actually happens. Um, in terms of opt-in and, and, and opt-out, um, th this is an important question about how they would be implemented because we know that um, people are more likely to um, uh, take up a service if they don't have to do anything additionally. So you could see a further uh, entrenchment of, of um, inequity if people had to then apply for a, a vaccine passport potentially as opposed to it being embedded uh, or automatically generated. But then in a fragmented health system like the US, that's extremely difficult to do. Um, so I, I see numerous kind of practical barriers to it, to it happening and uh, potential uh, unintended consequences. That's my initial yeah. reaction to it. Yeah, two very real um, barriers to that. Um, one, the vaccines are currently under FDA emergency use authorization. They are not under full approval yet. And so you really cannot mandate a vaccine in this country until there is full FDA approval. And that will come eventually, I'm sure, but that, that is one roadblock. Um, and I think as long as there is scarcity, if there's not full access, where every, um, at least adult who wants to get vaccinated can get vaccinated, I don't see how you can mandate that. Where I do see um, some possible mandates eventually would be in workplaces, in particular in healthcare, uh, in schools, uh, and then potentially for travel, because that is where you have precedence. You know, for example, in um, healthcare in New York State, we are required to get an influenza vaccination as healthcare workers, or you can wear a mask for all of the flu season. And you can imagine most people opt for the vaccination at that point. Uh, you know, we have um, mandates for uh, ch uh, childhood vaccinations to attend school, but there are ways of opting out of that. And then we have, uh, for example, yellow fever uh, certificates for vaccination for travel to certain areas. So I think those are the most likely places that this will be um, that this might at least be talked about because there, there is precedent, there are systems. Um, I think some of the other things that have been um, discussed like the CLEAR app and some others um, to show that you're vaccinated for other public settings, maybe a sports stadium or something like that. I think that's a, a much more complicated, um, heavier lift and, and I'm much more skeptical about something like that. Yeah, I think just interesting question, even in the sense of what do we mean by vaccine passports? We're we talking about a mandate or are we talking about, you know, the, the voluntary ability to show that you've been vaccinated to access the service. And they, those are really quite different things. Mm -hmm. Sandra, I'm curious if you have any re reflections on, on mandates and, you know, potential, you know, having passports for access from, from the communities that you work with. How would that align and how would that shift the conversation? Yeah, I, I think there would be some skepticism, again, that, you know, people will be left out, but also skepticism related to some sort of government monitoring or perception of monitoring, you know, um, and, you know, in the, you know, let's, let's face it, I mean, the highly racialized environment we live in where people don't see that many of their, especially locally, that government, you know, has their best interest at heart. So, 
But I think, and I think there's another challenge is, you know, I've read the coverage of Israel and what they're, you know, what they're doing in terms of the coverage is we are so fragmented and we don't even, and Celine, correct me if I'm wrong, we don't even have a good national immunization registry to begin with. And, you know, what we do have focuses more on children. I don't know that we have one at all for adults. Celine, is that... Am I right, right about that? Yeah, that's right. And so I think, you know, we need to start maybe stepping back and saying, you know, what might we need to do to make sure we even have that system in place, which is a, a big lift mm -hmm. to do, but would serve us well um, in the long run. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sandra. Um, next question. Since we don't know, oh, sorry, go ahead, Heidi. I, I don't want to, I know we don't have a lot of time, but <laughs> I think that I'm a bit frustrated with the whole thing on vaccine passports as if this is some kind of new idea. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've had my dog eared yellow vaccine certificate that I have saved like some grandmother treasure. <laughs> And, and I keep getting it updated. And maybe it's because I spend so much time in countries where I need to get all these travel vaccines. But this thing is precious, you know? And there are some countries where I need to show it and some settings where I need to show it and other cases where I don't. And a passport in itself just holds the stamps of different vaccines. So I think we should revive our yellow cards. And if you can get a vaccine, the passport itself is nothing. It's like getting an empty passport with no visas in it. You know, you need your visas and some of them are vaccines. I mean, I think we should try to normalize this and remind the world that, you know, it, it is setting based um, and it's not, no government is going to say everyone, well, it'd be rare that everyone has to take this vaccine. It's about going to school. It's about working in a hospital, as, as Celine was saying. Some countries say, you know, you can't come to our country if you, for instance, don't have a yellow fever vaccine. You can't go on Hodge pilgrimage unless you have, I think it's three vaccines, and I'm sure they're going to add COVID to it because they want to protect the masses, the gathering of the masses. And we don't even know how long some of these vaccines are going to last. So what's the expiry date? I mean, what good is a passport if you don't know if it's good for a month or if you know it's good for six months? So I think there's been a bit, um, I think we should just make it like, of course you have some certificate of your, I get my vaccine tomorrow, by the way, that's good news. Um, <laughs> and I'm gonna bring my yellow card. Just wanted to add that that's to right. your perspective. <laughs> I've got my yellow card too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Celine, were you saying something, sorry? No, no, no. I was just laughing. I think that's great. I, I do think I agree with Heidi. I think we should be taking more ownership of our health data period. And I think this is a piece of it. Um, and so I think any system that would allow for that, I think would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think many of us work, working in global health really uh, treasured the, that yellow card that we have. <laughs> And maybe we should talk about it more. Um, all right. So this is the um, next question. I think Heidi speaks to the point that you just made. Since we don't yet know about long-term efficacy of these vaccines, do we envision a scenario where we may have to be vaccinated yearly? If so, are governments setting up systems for this, especially as newer vaccines are able to work against the variants? So uh, I want to be clear that current vaccines do work against the variants. Um, there is a signal towards less efficacy, but still retaining efficacy. And so this is why uh, the different vaccine manufacturers are um, gearing up to have, if you want to call it a second generation COVID vaccine uh, booster, whatever you want to call it. Um, and Moderna is actually now in, in uh, phase three clinical trials with their uh, second generation vaccine. They just started that this week. So um, I, I do think it's something we need to stay on top of. If you look at how um, viruses that have jumped from animal hosts into humans, what we call zoonoses, um, how those evolve, and I think HIV is a great example of that, you have a lot more genetic heterogeneity early on. 
and then there's a stabilization. Um, and so I think what you're seeing, especially since it's, um, uh, this has been so widespread and the virus has had so much opportunity to mutate, you're seeing a huge amount of mutation at a population level, even if at an individual level, um, it's fairly rare. And so I think the, the, you're gonna see a lot more evolution of the virus early on, and then in subsequent years that will slow down. So I, I do anticipate uh, that we will be um, giving additional doses, you know, um, second generation vaccine, maybe the fall winter um, of this coming year, but I, I don't see this being like the flu. Um, it, it, these are very different um, viruses. They mutate very differently. And once we don't have this um, widespread community transmission throughout the, the world, frankly, your mutation rates are uh, at a population level going to slow and, and you're not going to see um, the same rate of emergence of variants as we have uh, over the past year. Great. Uh, and with that, Celine, I'm going to, uh, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time and I'm going to move us to closing. Uh, I really want to say a, a huge heart, heartfelt thank you to all of you. This has been such an incredible conversation, uh, really engaging. I've learned a lot. I, I'm, from the number of questions we've, we've gotten from our audience, I think they've really, really enjoyed it. Uh, and I think it's been incredible. Um, to our audience, um, on our closing slide, we have put up there some recent tools um, that you could uh, take a look at. We're also going to be sending an invite for a future event, a webinar uh, on some of these tools, and we'll be sharing a follow-up email with tools from our panelists as well. So you'll have a really good re rich resource. Uh, and yeah, we'll provide uh, details through an email. Again, thank you so much, everyone, our panelists. Uh, and thank you to all of our audience who's joined in, not only from the US, but from all over the world. Have a good day. <laughs>